literally like to constantly improve my Thai, but also to understand and speak the language of their tools and their materials and their methods. And it's actually more important to have that common ground, that kind of technical fluency um, than even the linguistic fluency. But, you know, sometimes I don't quite fit in. Um, and, you know, this place um, is never really quite concerned with proper fits. And sometimes those moments, that kind of moments of awkwardness or improvisation are, are celebrated. And there's kind of a certain pride in this ability to improvise. And, you know, I've been deeply fascinated by these moments ever since we got here, where a proper solution is either completely unavailable um, or perhaps entirely unknown. And so this no notion of proper becomes really like my own baggage, these constructs of, of this Western way of doing things right. Um, and that was really our first paradigm shift was kind of understanding um, kind of not only that the rules of the game had changed, but basically the, the goals of the game. And understanding that what was previously abundant is now scarce and what was previously held in reserve is now readily accessible. And specifically, I'm talking about labor and material. And this understanding this inverse relationship between um, the cost of labor and the cost of material. And in the West, it, it's, you know, labor is extremely expensive and you design towards and specify to reduce labor. And so materials, um, devices, objects um, become a way of reducing labor. And here it's the opposite. Lots of devices, tools, interesting materials are extremely scarce, but there's an abundance of labor. I missed that slide. So, wait, no, I didn't. You know, so these moments of, of improv, you know, like that, that bolt, the hole drilled slightly too large and then kind of filled in with these rusty nails. You know, those moments of improvisation, I think are really in some ways like the purest form of design, right? Everything we do as designers, as architects always feels so contrived, so repeated, so derivative. And it's really when you start to kind of get out into the landscape and see these, these moments of improvisation that, you know, I think you're seeing this ultra pure form of design that's motivated simply by scarce materials and a certain allocation of labor. So really we tried to kind of integrate this spirit into our practice, you know, rather than um, trying to feel bad about what we lost, we really tried to capitalize on what we had, had gained. And with a few months of getting here, we, we sat down with one of the Thai magazines and one of their first questions was about our process. And they asked me, are we a theory-based or a practice-based studio? And of course, my immediate thought was, why can't we be both? Um, and I think my actual answer was something a little bit more like that our theory stems from our practice and our practice is guided by a theory by a theoretical framework. But the nature of the question was something that bothered for me, for me, bothered me for a while, which was that the assumption was that a practice had to either be, uh, an architecture studio had to either be practice-based, doing practical things, um, making money, um, you know, solving problems for developers quickly and efficiently, or theory-based, you know, being creative, being irresponsible, probably losing money. Um, and somehow we've managed to do both, which is be practical and lose money at the same time. But that's probably another conversation. Um, so this idea of the theoretical, the conceptual and the empirical, the kind of practical, the handmade um, is something that really kind of has guided us. You know, this idea that creativity and practicality, there are odds with each other. Um, you know, we always operated under this assumption that, that um, you know, technical knowledge, so this kind of practical knowledge 
is in a way a catalyst for creativity for creativity. So in other words, this kind of deeper, more hard earned empirical knowledge, like the better we understand the tool, um, the more creative we can be with it, the more we understand the material, the kind of the more strange things we can ask from it. So this idea that technical knowledge becomes this kind of catalyst for creativity, um, I think helps guide this kind of the theoretical and the empirical approach. And I think, you know, a, a good way, a, a phrase or um, a quote that I've, that's really kind of resonated with me over the last couple of years that um, um, I heard fairly recently. Um, and I, I guess I won't give the whole backstory, but basically the quote is, uh, knowledge is rumor until it enters the muscle. And I'll repeat that. Knowledge is rumor until it enters the muscle. And it's a really kind of odd, sparse arrangement of words. But I think there's the selection of each of those words that's, that's really interesting. And I like the word rumor because it has this kind of negative connotation to it, like that you might, that you might have this knowledge or this information and you received it through the improper channels. Um, and it may or may not be true. And you don't really know that. There's something kind of scandalous about it. And you really shouldn't be passing it on. So in other words, if we look, if we think about that quote again, knowledge is rumor until it enters the muscle. It's almost like that something that enters your head through your ears or your eyes is perhaps not really relevant or solidified until you take action upon it, until it kind of exits your hand. And I think that that quote is really, I don't know, I think really kind of formalizes this idea for me the best. You know, and this connection between action and knowledge has been deeply explored by people that are certainly much smarter than me, much more well-spoken than me. Um, Johanny Plasma would be one. I was just showing the book that's sitting here on my table, The Thinking Hand, um, and certainly within the pages of The Eyes of the Skin, um, he covers that. Um, but it was really a short essay um, by Marco Frascari called Tell the Tale Detail that I first encountered while in actually undergrad in architecture school that I can kind of credit with pushing me off in this direction. And in that essay, he talks about the detail as a generator in the sense that starting with the small and how the small relates to the large, that the detail plays a critical role in both the constructing, so the actual act of making, as well as the construing, which is the act of giving meaning. You know, and it's here at these details, at these joints that, that we as a studio choose to dwell. This kind of intimate level of architecture that we find to be really the most compelling point of understanding. Um, you know, to the point that maybe some of our work is boring from far away, but we like that there's a certain amount of reward or delight um, that comes from this kind of more intimate discovery. And I think you can say the same thing about lots of types of interaction in life. Um, whether it's a meaningful book or a nice chair or just a good friend that we should achieve a deeper level of appreciation with time. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to throw a lot around a lot of books and authors at this point, but I guess this would be a good time to bring up another um, kind of important or meaningful essay for me, um, which is from the book um, called Air Guitar by Dave Hickey, which is behind me in my library somewhere. Um, and in that, um, book, he talks about, um, the perception of, of one's work, the perception of art. And I'll paraphrase him here, but basically he says that much of art, and I think we can apply the same to design and architecture is perceived with a wow, huh, kind of experience. So in that the viewer is seduced by something visually impressive or catching and then disappointed with a lack of understanding or lack of content to be discovered. So the opposite experience is something akin to, huh, wow, which is that the viewer, an experience in which the viewer is intrigued and drawn in and then excited, not disappointed about what they discover. So I always hope for the huh, wow, 
type of experience with our work. And again, it's the same thing with, like I said, a good friend. You know, if you see somebody and you're like, oh, that guy's so cool, and you go up and talk to him, if he's not the coolest guy, if he doesn't fit your expectations, then of course you immediately um, are disappointed. And so we like our architecture to be ugly, but interesting, I guess. Um, that's not entirely true, but you know, don't get me wrong, this emphasis on, on craft and, and making and tools and dust and, and, and dirty hands is not necessarily a rejection of digital technology um, or these kind of new ways of, of working. Um, you know, I honestly think more in AutoCAD, more fluidly in AutoCAD than I do in my sketchbook, although I guess AutoCAD is not exactly <laughs> um, the cutting edge of technology. But, you know, we don't necessarily reject technology um, just because we spend a lot of time with our hands. You know, I always try to emphasize um, with my staff, with my new staff, with our interns that that AutoCAD, that these digital programs, uh, Rhino, that we use are not really, and this is, I think, part of the break from, from education to, quote unquote, the real world, um, is that you spend this so much time in these digital worlds, but really, I guess, you know, that world is not necessarily closed. It's not this um, finite space, but really to think about it more like a window becomes a more powerful um, way of looking at it. So that when you draw that kind of polyline across your screen, you need to imagine that it's a piece of steel and that maybe it's sharp, maybe it's too sharp, or it's a piece of wood. Again, maybe it's too sharp, or it's a piece of plastic, or it's a piece of leather. So that polyline, I think it really helps to kind of understand its, its future life. And kind of understanding this relationship between craftsmanship, making things, and draftsmanship, the represent representation of things, I think, is a critical juncture as well. And, you know, speaking of new employees, you know, when we, when I interview, there's always this point in the interview process where I talk about basically a studio make being kind of these three overlapping things. Um, first, we're a studio, you know, we're a creative atelier where we dream and are speculative and we like to be invent inventive. Um, but we're also an office, so we spend a fair amount of time in spreadsheets, um, looking at values, looking at expenses, looking at costs, um, sending emails. Um, you know, we have internal forms to get stuff done. We maintain paper trails, um, that sort of office kind of stuff. And we're also a workshop. Um, we keep our tools sharp. We say organized, we keep our workspaces neat, we sweep at the end of the day, and we operate with this um, kind of workmanship attitude. And so whether you are in AutoCAD or in the workshop, at the end of the day, you should sweep up, right? So you keep your space clean, orderly, and well-oiled. So having this, our studio, um, which I'll, like I said, I'll walk you through shortly, you know, highly connected to our workshop isn't just practical, but it's also symbolic. So this labor and material are inseparable from the thoughts and the drawings. And oftentimes designing an object or a surface or a space involves designing a technique or a tool first. So I'm gonna pause here um, for a second before we transition to the work. And, um, you know, I think as our office has grown um, and the type of work that we do has diversified, has spread out rather than narrowed, um, which I guess is contrary to the, to the path of most practices who kind of continue to, to narrow in a type of work or to get larger in scale, um, we seem to have done the opposite. I don't know if that's a good trend or a bad trend, um, but many of our larger projects, you know, have been... At a, at a distance to us, they're a little further away. But this idea of, of scale and scope and defining what we do through these terms, um, I think is an important aspect because no matter the scale or the scope of work, there's a commonality to all of it. And to me, it's all studio make. So 
all of those previous concepts that I just talked about apply no matter the scale or the scope. And so the process and the way we approach all of our projects is, is basically with the same rigor, with the same sense of material and craft. Um, and so while we might have perfect clarity about um, you know, our place in the world, we found that clients have a hard time kind of wrapping their mind around it. So I spent some time uh, a few months ago trying to very precisely describe what this thing is that we call Studio Make. <laughs> and it was this kind of list of, of services. And I tried to be kind of straightforward and cover the spectrum. Um, and even though it seems kind of broad and expansive, it really kind of comes down to these three basic things, which is designing, making, talking. <laughs> so you can kind of pay us to conceptualize ideas. You can pay us to make or actualize ideas, or you can pay us to verbalize ideas. Um, so another way of saying that is we do architecture. We do interiors and furniture and products. We also do construction, fabrication, and then consulting, design consulting, production consulting, designing, making, talking. So there you go. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna jump into the projects. Um, and I'll start here with, with Guanyin Pavilion, which is a project I did show last year. And I think it's, it is our largest kind of more, most traditional architecture with a capital A kind of, kind of project. Um, and we did it um, within the first couple of years of, of establishing our practice. And so, like I mentioned, we've um, over the years have kind of been going down in scale to the point where um, just recently I designed and made a doorknob. So from buildings to doorknobs, we do it all. Um, okay, so Guanyin Pavilion um, is a, a university building at uh, the university I teach at in Rangsit University, which is just north of Bangkok. And the building um, was one of those university buildings um, that existed before it actually had a purpose. Um, and when we got involved, the original design that was proposed from the building for the building was as a um, quite literally a, a Chinese temple, like a replica of a Chinese temple, because the building was to house this uh, new faculty or new department that was being formed called the, the Thai Chinese Institute, uh, actually the Chinese Thai Institute, I believe I got it backwards. And so the, the purpose of this institute was to foster and kind of um, build relationships between Rangsit University and various Chinese universities. So the building had this very symbolic purpose. And so we, we came in um, kind of unsolicited to this project pretty early on and um, tried to convince people that symbolism did not have to be um, so red and so temple-like. Um, and so we basically sought to create a building um, that had representative moments, moments that were symbolic and could be investigated and considered, but were not, not exactly facsimiles. Um, and so we strove to kind of create a building that had these overlapping elements of um, and these blurry lines of between what could be considered Thai architecture and what could be considered Chinese architecture. And so the shape of the building is, is a bit formal, um, but really the, for us, the most important part of it has to do with the material of it. And so it's a brick building um, and there's brick kind of two ways. On the right side, you'll see the there's a fairly solid mass of brick and that's a traditional kind of thick brick wall. And on the left, we have what we created was a brick, like a lightweight brick wall, which is a screened wall. And so it has this kind of nighttime experience where the section on the left is the um, exhibition hall. And for events, we wanted it to be this kind of lantern-like space that really when activated, kind of served as a beacon to the rest of the university. And so this partee we established very early on and started thinking about these bricks um, 
And so the first thing we did was we actually went to a brick factory, um, which is really how we start thinking about materials a lot of times is just go to the source. And so we went to a brick factory um, nearby, a couple hours outside of Bangkok and spent some time looking at all the different materials, looking at the process, understanding um, how they're made. And we started thinking about the, the possibilities of brick, which is of course something that architects and builders have been doing for thousands of years. And we started thinking about shapes that we could, could use in multiple ways. And so we came up with this peaked shape brick, which is kind of echoes the shape of the building. And interestingly enough, the shape of the building and the shape of the brick really kind of happened about at the same time. I don't really recall which one happened first, but in creating this, this kind of dynamic brick shape, we created a single unit that could start to be used in multiple ways. So you can see that the peak is offset. And so when the bricks are stacked, the peaks can be lined up to create this kind of crisp uh, line across the facade, or they can be alternated which kind of creates this turbulence. And then they're used two different ways. So on the solid wall, they're used horizontally. And on the screen wall, they're used then vertically. Um, so for this project, we were, because it's a university building, a very large building, we were simply the architects. Um, meaning we were going to produce a set of drawings um, as detailed and thorough as possible. And then at a certain point, hand those drawings out to go out for bid and somebody else would build it with, um, with maybe our minimal assistance. Um, but what we did do was because this brick was such an important element, we had it prototyped very early on. Um, and bricks are, are slow. <laughs> brick factories are slow. So it took us about a year a year and a half to really finalize the the prototypes with the brick factory. Um, and so we ended up with basically two different types of bricks. You can see um, the gray uh, bricks in the upper right are actually the vertical bricks. So you can see the, the hole for the reinforcing is passing through vertically. And then the bricks in the lower right, which are have been fired in are red, um, are the horizontal bricks, and you can see the reinforcing holes are um, running vertically. So those bricks are actually extruded in two different directions and made in two different ways, but we can talk about that later. The other thing that's interesting here is if you look at the bricks right now in the lower right-hand corner, they're red. But of course, the final bricks are quite gray. And so that was a that was a process that this factory had been doing and had done before, but wasn't really advertising because it's I guess kind of a pain in the ass but it basically what it is is it's it's uh we're double firing the brick so the brick goes through the kiln once and it's red and then it goes through in uh what's called a reduction process and it's actually fired again at a different temperature and that actually changes the color of the clay body um so basically red bricks turn gray um and this was a pretty interesting kind of poetic aspect that we like to talk about in regards to the project because largely Chinese bricks use a, a gray type of clay. And so Chinese bricks are typically gray, whereas Thai bricks are typically red. So we like this idea conceptually that we kind of made a Chinese brick using clay soil. Um, and so, you know, this idea and, and kind of going to that factory and, and using these gray bricks and using them in, in that in a certain way is something that we wouldn't have able wouldn't have ever been able to achieve if we hadn't really kind of done this deep dive into the technical aspects of it. And certainly if we hadn't prototyped the bricks ourselves as a studio before um, the contractor was involved, because at that first bidding meeting, we were able to walk in with this final brick in hand place it on the table and say, this is the exact brick. This is the factory you're going to order it from. And here's everything you need to know about it. And you need to order this quantity and you need to order it by this day. Um, and so having all that information resolved meant that this brick was able to happen. So we'll kind of run through some of the interior images 
Here's kind of the back side of that screen wall. This is looking down into that exhibition space. And now this is um, that exhibition space there is kind of that open um, kind of exuberant space. And then on the opposite side are these kind of darker, quieter, um, cooler kind of administrative and meeting rooms. And so this becomes kind of a, a little bit more refined, a little bit more cozy. So upstairs are office spaces. Uh, another thing with this project is we, um, we made a complete 3D model of it where we modeled and placed every single brick. <laughs> so we, and the, of course the contractors hated us, but basically we didn't give any dimensions on the key dimensions for the brick walls. We would just give a specific number of bricks because we didn't want the contractors cutting the bricks. So we were very specific about the number of bricks and the orientation of each and every brick. And so in the whole project, there's only seven bricks that we allowed them to cut. So there was basically seven bricks in specific locations where there is no other way to detail it other than to cut a brick. And then that brick, that cut end is hidden in a very specific way. So we, we basically gave them complete kind of detailed drawings and literally showed them where every single brick would be because we wanted these tolerances. Um, well, not the tolerances to be absolute because we gave a lot of room for error. We understand that a brick wall could never be exactly what we want it to be because it's, you know, the grout is never exactly the thick, same thickness and there's this kind of handmade quality to it. Um, but we were very specific about the module, I should say that. This is a back service stair. This is actually one of my favorite stairs that I've ever designed is this kind of fire escape stair. It only uses channel for the for the structure and the treads and then rod for the for the handrail. This is the back, um, which is actually kind of the entry. So you enter from the side and kind of come into the back of the building and then into this kind of courtyard space. The roof is a post-tension concrete slab. It's quite thin. Here you can see that kind of turbulence detail. Um, and then also peeking down in the corner there, we included some of the, the, the single fired bricks. So we have some of that orange brick um, there that has not been double fired. But the, the, the issue with that double firing, like I mentioned before, is not only does it change the color, um, you get, of course, this now wide variation in color, but it also shrinks more. So, you know, with this whole kind of anytime you have a ceramic or a masonry kind of firing process, you're taking clay and you're firing it, you get shrinkage. And so even that red brick, even though it's 100 percent hard, 100 percent dry, when it gets fired again, it shrinks again. So that was what took a lot of the um, a lot of the R and D time, a lot of the prototyping time, was getting the shrinkage, getting the the, the original dimensions um, perfect, so that when the brick was fired, it got our final dimensions. So there you go, some more details. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to the other end of the spectrum. Um, to some recent work. Um, and these are place structures that we um, built. Notice I didn't say design, but that we built for a mall, um, for a local mall here in downtown Bangkok called Central World. And so um, these place structures were designed by another architecture office, um, Klein Dytham, which is a, a Japanese office. Um, well, an office based in Japan, but it's run by a British couple. Pretty interesting office. And so they were designing a lot of the interior renovation for this, for this kind of huge, um, expensive, elaborate mall. And they had designed these play structures. Um, and then we were brought in by the client to um, basically take their schematic designs and develop the details and then fabricate. So what we received is what you see in the upper left-hand corner. So which is this really very simple um SketchUp model. And then we basically figured out how to make it, how to do all the detailing, 
um, how to kind of fabricate it in a way that we could um, do 95% of the, the work at our, at our shop and then simply assemble it at the mall because making things at malls requires you to work at night and that's no fun. So we tried to really minimize the amount of site work that we were doing and also tried to design a system where the client could be able to adjust it and modify it over time. So we were really just kind of taking somebody else's concept and, and kind of running with it. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, coming, a lot of designers might have an ego problem with that. You know, they might think, oh, it's not my design. I don't want to do it. I don't want to touch it. Um, you know, it has to be my idea. But, you know, I think for me, I still have an enormous amount of pride in this. Um, because to me, it's really the details that are that are pulling it together that that kind of affect the experience for me. Um, not more so than the overall design, but in an equal importance, equal level of importance. So here's some of the details, that final thing. And then this is another one. This is a play structure um, from the same office. So you can kind of see we got this sketch up about these kind of boxes. And then we figured out all the detailing. How can we use um, this kind of really thick wood? How can we uh, assemble it very quickly? How can we make it so that it can be replaced or modified or upgraded later? Um, you know, because this is a public play structure, it sees uh, an enormous amount of abuse. Um, so over the years, we've started to design more and more stuff for kids. Um, and I've started to say that, you know, designing stuff for, for children and playgrounds and kindergartens is the same as designing stuff for prisons. It just has to be absolutely bulletproof. Um, you know, hidden fasteners cannot be disassembled easily, all that stuff. Um, and then here's the third component. Um, another play structure, this one a little more traditional. And this one was done actually by a different office uh, based in Germany. Um, and then the SketchUp models you see on the on the right and bottom there, that's all our kind of fabrication and shop drawings, all these laser cut brackets. Um, we've been doing a lot of four axis laser cutting, um, which is kind of objects of rotation. So you can laser cut pipe, which you can kind of see those slots that we're, we're cutting so that the brackets fit together. There are the details on that. Okay, and then the last project I'll show you here um, before we go walk around. And also, I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm open to questions um, and discussion, kind of at any point here too. Um, but I'll I'll run through this. Um, so this project, I guess, is kind of a hybrid in ways. Um, it's a coffee shop, a small cafe, um, for uh, clients of ours that we've worked with before, but we had not designed a cafe for them. Um, so really interesting clients, um, of course, good clients make great projects. Um, but for this project, they came to us and, you know, kind of sheepishly were like, Hey, will you design this tiny minuscule cafe for us? We have a tiny minuscule budget as well. Um, and, you know, when you get out of school and you start dealing with fees and, um, you know, how profitability and, and how you make money, you'll quickly realize that it's very difficult to make money on small projects. So, you know, we have developed over the years a, what we call a minimum project budget, which we will have to base a fee on a minimum project budget. And if the project budget is below that fee, either unfortunately we can't take it or we need to charge you this higher fee. Um, so for this project, the, you know, our fee would have been more than the entire budget for the project. <laughs> But what we did was we basically proposed a kind of design build process where we would design it and fabricate it and install it so that in a way we could kind of capture as much of the scope as possible, which then gave us opportunity for us to kind of um, not lose so much money on the design work because we could make money on the fabrication work. So this is design, build, install, fabricate, all that scope. Um, so here's a couple of details here. I'll jump, actually should jump to this shot. But so basically, as you can see, it's a small cafe. It's got, uh, I think it's eight, seven seats. 
Um, and then it just kind of has this counter. So it's a walk up, order some coffee um, and go. And so, you know, this, this company, um, they don't import coffee. They only use Thai coffees. Um, so this kind of idea of authenticity, of materiality, of kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of presenting themselves, presenting their coffee as this well-crafted product is, of course, something that they wanted to translate to their to this installation. So, um, you know, we started off with this really simple idea about having um, a fast bar and a slow bar. And so this wood, this teak log is the fast bar. You walk up, you order your coffee and you go. And then the curving terrazzo white bar um, is the slow bar where you sit, you kind of, you know, you enjoy the cup of coffee. And so the slow bar, like I said, is made out of terrazzo. Um, those are kind of individually crafted kind of wedges that we made here at our shop and then transported to the site, bolted them together. Um, the teak is actually from a, uh, has, has a bit of a history with the client themselves. So the teak was, the teak log was salvaged. Um, it had actually been in my, at my studio for about six years. Um, they'd given it to me and it was at my studio for about six years before this project came up. So it was a really kind of nice moment to kind of bring it back. Um, you can see that detail in the end. So that's kind of the view that first greets you as you walk in is that end view um, kind of sets up the experience for the bar. And then at the back there is this kind of display system. Um, and so at this point they had kind of run out of money. So we basically kind of came up with this display system um, and then gave them kind of this minimal set of parts so that they could really display kind of a, a kind of a minimum set of retail stuff. And that with time they could upgrade and start to have more and more on this kind of retail shelf because eventually they want to be able to sell, you know, all kinds of coffee paraphernalia um, to the caffeine addicts that come in. Um, not sure why that's flashing. So, yeah, so the idea is that they could kind of expand um, and they could upgrade it in the future. Okay, so that kind of um, wraps up, I guess, the projects that I'd like to show. Um, do you, should we stop for questions now, or should I just should we go on a walkabout? Let's do your walkabout. I think, uh, David, do, do your walkabout. Walk yeah. Okay. So I'm going to switch. Which is I that okay? I, I mean, is everyone okay? Yeah. We do the walkabout. Oh. Yeah. Okay, no protests. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch here. We want to check out your fish eye camera, David. Okay. 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 Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. Now I switch camera. Okay. Here we are. So now I'll go mobile here. Um, okay. So I guess I'll I'll start with the space I was actually in, um, which is the library. Um, so now you're seeing behind the camera. And the library um, is actually above the, the workshop, which is down here. Um, so you can see the, the workshop down there. Um, and then out over there is the, the work yard. So the library up here um, 
is is kind of the in between the the studio and the house. Um, so we'll have meetings up here. Um, I do all my Zoom lectures and, <laughs> and Microsoft Team lectures up here. Um, and then let's head down to the studio. Um, so here you can see the back the backyard of sorts. Um, this is this is the house. So I live um, used to live upstairs. Um, let me close the doors here to keep the air conditioning spilling out. Um, so like I mentioned, we're a bit north of Bangkok, which is um, nice. So we're in the suburbs, um, which gives us quite a bit of space. Um, allows us, yeah, space to make things. Um, maybe you can hear the chickens. <laughs> um, we have some guinea hen and some, some geese out there somewhere. And then down here is the studio space. So hopefully everybody's working hard. Nobody's on Facebook when I walk in. Right? Okay, so here's everybody. Well, not everybody, some people. Can you say hi? Hi, hi, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the studio space here. Um, can kind of walk around and, and show some things. See, I guess fairly traditional in some sense and that it's a big kind of mess. Um, we have some models, various models of some of our projects. Um, this is a prefabricated house that we were working on. Um, here's an interiors kind of model project. I don't know if you can see the, the view there. Um, but then we also over here have uh, <clears throat> more like samples and prototypes. So these are parts and pieces from um, various projects that we've been working on, figuring out how to make things. You can see those red pieces. Those are the first prototypes um, for the that red play structure. Um, we'll see if you can see what these samples were about. But <clears throat> what we did was we made these samples to kind of explore um, this way of kind of joining four pipes to get that, that structure. Um, and then we have these horizontal pieces of steel that actually fit into holes that were laser cut into the pipe. And that allows, um, like you saw in that model, uh, allows different things to kind of hang on there. And so one of the things we were exploring was the detail um, of how those pipes come through so I don't know if you can kind of see there. On this one, you can see there's kind of a little, um, I don't know, bump there where we welded the end of the pipe. So the end of the pipe didn't stick through, but there was a hole cut. Do I have another sample of the pre-welded one? No. Where the hole was laser cut large enough that the, that the pipe did not stick through, but we could do what's called a puddle weld. So we come in and we just fill in that hole um, that was originally there with a weld. And so we're, what we were exploring was if we could just leave the welds kind of raw and then powder coat over it, or if on this example here, if we needed to grind off the welds. And what we found was that even though we grind off the weld, it still kind of shows imperfections. And we decided that it was better to kind of be upfront and straightforward about the imperfection. Um, rather than try to hide it and be imperfect about hiding it, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so we made these and presented those to the client to kind of review that. Um, so yeah, see a lot of prototypes here. This is um, a sample from the, I don't know if you can see that. You hold it in front of the white background here. This is a sample from the shelf at the roots um, project. So you can see that this is a steel pipe um, with multiple kind of laser cut parts. And so that shape is cut out with a four axis laser cutter. Um, we don't have it, but we send it out. Um, so this is another kind of um, series of projects, samples. These are door handles. 
um, that we make. This is kind of a, li a little bit of our product. Um, see, we can walk down to the far end of the studio. Here you can see my desk, which is um, kind of a mess. Lots of material samples. This is kind of an interesting sample that I was just had cut for a, a large project that we're working on. Um, hopefully you can see that. You can kind of see there's two different shapes that I laser cut out of there. And what I'm exploring is basically how a bolt, um, what's called a carriage bolt, can fit into a structure. I'm gonna to try to set this down and show you. So this would be the carriage bolt. So you can kind of see that. And you can see that the head is flat, but that underneath it is these kind of the square shape. So the idea is that you have this shape and the carriage bolt, that one's too large it's for this size. Carriage bolt goes in, slides down and is locked in place. So in this case, um, in this little triangular shape here, the carriage bolt can slide down. Uh, if you can see it, can slide down, but then stays locked in place. It can't slide out. Here it can slide out, which is nice in that it gives some adjustability, um, but perhaps isn't as locked in. Okay, so that's um, my desk here. This is man, this is our studio manager. Hi. Hi. Um, here are some um, ceramic pots um, that we made last year here at the studio. Uh, a friend of mine from grad school was, um, I guess, more or less an intern for a couple months, and he made lots of pots. And then for a project that we were working on, he made some tiny little models of pots. So these are representing um, very large kind of full-size planters. So we we're doing a, um, this kind of planter guardrail. So we we're making a model using using these. And then while he was with us, he also kind of made some some uh, some knobs, some drawer pulls, by kind of making shapes out of clay and then giving them a little squeeze. So they had this kind of imperfection. Um, see some more kind of architectural models. Oh, here's the, this is our model for, for Roots for that cafe project. So this was one of our very early conceptual models. Um, I always like to, for clients, present a um, conceptual model at the very beginning, um, especially rather than any anything kind of 3D, um, because I think it's a way of describing the ideas um, without making the project seem too real for them. So it's a way for us to kind of have a discussion and keep the project in a very preliminary point of view. Um, even though you know we could have made this pretty easily in SketchUp, um, I think that when you have that kind of 3D computer model and it looks maybe um, too real, the clients think that it's kind of too quick to jump um, from that to the final project. Um, and plus, I just like making a physical models. So I was mentioning that um, those pots as a facade. Here's a tiny model of that kind of pot facade see those little guys there. Um, here's one of our early models for the Guan Yin Pavilion, actually. Let's fix the camera here. So you can see that roof shape. Um, at this point, we were thinking that both sides were screened. Um, and then this is the more final model. Whoops, having some structural failures there. And actually, our first um, idea, too, was to have this kind of lattice work on the, on the roof. Um, <clears throat> but then ultimately decided to kind of simplify things and use a um, precast, or not sorry, not precast, post tension slab. It could stay very thin. Uh, some models for various house projects. Um, some other one. Um, okay. So I guess we can pop over here real quick and then we can go walk through the shops. So these are some other prototypes. Um, one of the houses that we're designing right now, this looks a little dark. Um, we are um, 
we were doing the architecture, you know, designing the spaces and all that stuff. Um, but also very early on, we're really thinking about, if you can kind of see that, the column. And so we've got this, been exploring this idea of using this um, kind of plus shaped column, like um, very similar to the Barcelona Pavilion. Um, so using four angles that come together to make this kind of plus shape. And what we're doing is we're trying to basically give that little space in between some functionality. So here you can see a little light switch in there. Um, other places we have recessed lighting. And so what we've been doing is we've exploring um, uh, basically this detail and how to get it done while we're still kind of working through the design development um, and construction documents. And so for this project here, we, um, because of kind of the importance of this steel column and stuff, we decided to also be the um, uh, steel fabricator. So we will be the structural steel contractor, um, but we will not build the whole house. Um, here in white, you can kind of see these are some of the samples, the prototypes that we did for the, um, that last place structure that was also red. So again, you can kind of see this um, kind of methodology we've been working on, where again, we've kind of laser cut these slots in the pipes and then laser cut stuff to then fit in, assemble together, you know, trying to kind of create ways in which I can kind of make a kit of parts and then have that kit of parts come together um, pretty easily. This is a, a prototype for a, um, a bench that we made. Um, most of this kind of rib structure is actually hidden from view. Um, so this is a bench that we made um, that's outside of an Apple store. Um, some more kind of prototypes and samples. This also uh, cut out of a pipe. So you can kind of see cut out of a pipe and then it becomes this shelf bracket. Okay, let's um, can go check out the shop. Okay, so shop right now is quiet because um, it would be difficult to do this with, <laughs> with noise going, but basically this is the inside shop here. Um, and in this space have a lot of the kind of woodworking tools um, as well as metalworking tools. So large bandsaw, hand tools. Um, this big structure is something that we just kind of assembled and laid out in order to um, temporarily in order to do a bunch of cuts um, for this plywood project. Here's our mill and drill. Um, let's see, sanding station, of course, the ever important table saw. Um, and then and this is hardware and screw city. So you can never have enough screws and nuts and bolts. Um, so that's all this stuff here. Samples, prototypes, tools, um, the workshop here. Um, and then out here, oh, actually this is all the steel for that house that I was mentioning. So here you can see the, um, these are all the angle pieces. And so this is actually a custom size and uh, custom dimension, custom uh, thickness. So we're able to specify the actual dimensions of the angle, 85 millimeters by 85 millimeters, 10 millimeters thick. And then we are fortunate enough to find a factory that can do a full six meter bend, um, which if you've ever uh, seen a, a break, a metal bending machine, um, one that can do six meters is pretty massive. Um, so those are the columns there. And then these are all the beams, which are a pair of channels. So they're all kind of stacked up, waiting for action. Um, and then this is the outside workshop. So now to just try to orient you a little bit, I first came out of the library up on that balcony up there then walked into the studio and walked out the workshop there. Um, Another view of the backyard. So my guys working here. Um, we've got some other guys off site, but um, doing some welding work. 
So these are a series of these are a series of shelves down here, or about to be shelves. Um, so this is all made out of flat bar. It's kind of welded together. So we bent these corners to get that kind of nice round radius um, on a hydraulic press. So we did that here in our shop. And then he's got everything you can see, he's just got everything tacked together. So he'll come back and fully weld those. Um, and then I think like I mentioned um, early on in, in our early chat, um, our guys also live here on site. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the layout here. Um, and that's what we got going on. I guess in terms of just general projects that we have happening right now are, um, like I mentioned, the house that we're doing design work for um, and are also doing the structural steel for. Um, I've got a house that we're proposing to do um, prefabricated. So we would actually build the house here um, and then bring it up to uh, the site, which is in Chiang Mai. Um, and then a couple fabrication projects for other designers. And um, what else? An interiors project, um, an architectural screen for a client. Um, and I guess that about covers it. So I guess I'm happy to open it up for questions at this point. Thank you, so David, I don't know for how. The, yeah, thank you for yeah, the, uh, yeah. the great tour. Um, I'm going to let some students ask questions, actually. That would be the best thing is to. Sure. Yeah. If you've got anyone there to. Yeah, I mean, you guys also, the students you guys ask, um, I actually prefer dumb questions. So if you have dumb questions, I'll take those. I'm kidding, of course. Um, but you can ask anything. Don't feel like it's got to be can ask me, what is that? Or can you show me this detail? Don't be shy. Hi. I actually got a question. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you like to design from the details and then go from there into like the bigger building, I guess, or like the bigger structure. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about how that process works, like any challenges when you do that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, let me go back up to the library here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when, you know, every project's different, of course, but I think, um, I think the, the, the starting point for a lot of projects Sorry, hold on a sec. Might be a specific detail. Is it? Hold on, I'm getting some feedback. I wonder if that's me. Okay. Um, is that better? Okay. Yeah, so for it, it really just kind of depends on the project. A lot of times, I'll start with a specific material um, or start with a, um, how do I describe it? Yeah, I guess I, I guess when, when I'm thinking about even a house, you know, as I'm designing a house or thinking about a house, of course, you're thinking about the spaces um, and thinking about the flow of those spaces um, or how the client would live there. But I guess I'm also thinking about kind of what the client is interacting with um, and what's holding up those spaces. 
And so I think it's just, it's just natural that I think my mind wanders. Um, and so with that, you know, specifically with the house project where I was kind of showing you that kind of plus shaped detail, you know, that those columns were kind of expressed in that very early schematic model. And so, you know, I was kind of thinking about this house um, and okay, this house could have these kind of, you know, series of fairly tightly spaced columns. And okay, if we have these fairly tightly spaced columns, um, you know, maybe they should be somewhat expressive or they should have kind of a personality or a presence. And then I just start thinking about, you know, what that could be. So um, I guess it just, it's just kind of comes naturally in the sense that as I'm thinking about the big picture, I'm also thinking about the small parts that will kind of ultimately construct that big picture. And so I guess it's, um, yeah, I think the benefit in that too, and, and kind of thinking non non-linearly is that you can allow those, those, um, those details or those, those kind of early, um, more small scale decisions to influence the bigger picture um, and vice versa. Um, so for example, like that roots, the roots project, um, you know, as soon as he started talking to me about the project, I realized that we needed to use that teak log that I had this teak log that had come from them that had given it to me and was like, it was just perfect. It needed to be as part of the project. And so, you know, this idea of, of the slow bar being this kind of cool um, terrazzo and, and the, um, and the, um, you know, the quicker kind of service area being this log, it, it, it kind of naturally happened because I had that log from the beginning, that kind of early idea. So I guess it's, it just kind of happens naturally to, to think about multiple things at the same time. I don't know how well that answers your question, but. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I guess, you know, for me too, I'm, I'm easily distracted. And so I think that, well, I'm easily distracted and also kind of um, a little obsessive. So in, in some ways, establishing those, those important details early on, you know, allows me to kind of switch gears. So look at large scale, you know, kind of floor plan issues. And then I might get kind of frustrated with, you know, not being able to make this bathroom layout work. And then I can always shift back onto that column and kind of think about how that column's going to work because, you know, resolving that column detail is going to take months. But if I wait until, you know, when you would normally resolve column details in a traditional architectural process, it would be too late. I might not have enough time to really resolve um, or really kind of integrate that idea in a, in a meaningful way. Anybody else? Don't be shy. You would think that Thai people are shy, but you can't compare it with Malaysian students. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear okay. You. I thought somebody was... Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about uh, when you were talking about the red bars, um, I think it was about um, 
to the space for the kids and stuff. When you mentioned something about the bars, we were trying to um, I think join them together or something like that. And you actually uh, realize that there is there was some imperfections, but you at the end of the day, the, per the perfection, the imperfection, or something like that. So I wanted to ask. Uh, usually, for us, when we are designing or when we are doing our work, we usually get to a point where uh, we don't really know how to continue. Or we see so many imperfections in our work, and we don't really know how to solve the problem. So, how do you actually? Um, how do you actually, uh, let's for example, in this case, you decided that you thought that the intersection can actually be an advantage of the bar. So, how do you actually um, uh, apply this? Like, I mean, generally, generally speaking, because usually when you decide that, okay, this might actually be good, even if it's been perfect. It might actually not look good or not be good. I don't know if I'm making it. I missed that last part. Can you could you just restate that last part there? Yeah. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, like, usually when uh, we have um, something that is not perfect, okay, something that doesn't look perfect, how do we actually find the perfection in it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I understand your question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's something that, that we've kind of have talked about a lot over the years. Like, um, you know, we had a project, um, my wife did a project in grad school um, that she called FLAWED, F-L-A-W-E-D, FLAWED, you know, like with error. Um, and in that project, she was, um, it was a series of ceramic, oh, look at this. I have one right here. Let me show you. <clears throat> so on ceramic, um, so this ceramic bowl here, right? So this ceramic bowl is made using a um, slip casting process. So basically like a, a, a block of plaster, you pour liquid clay into it. So that block of plaster has the shape of a bowl on the inside. You pour liquid clay into it. And then the clay that touches the plaster edge dries. And then at a certain point in a very specific timing, you dump the liquid clay out. And what's left is that skin that forms against the plaster and that's the bowl shape. So that's how most industrial um, ceramic pieces are made. So in that process of, of kind of having that plaster block, filling it with liquid clay, um, and then dumping out, oops, and then dumping out uh, the, the remaining liquid clay, as that clay comes out, it drips, okay? Now, in a, at, 99.9 percent .9%, well actually at all ceramic factories they come back and they trim off that 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 drip and what we did was we we basically kept the drips so we made a series of bowls very simple bowl shape with a very simple um kind of process but we kept the the drips and so basically we kept the flaws you know so we we're interested in this idea of using a kind of mass production technique um, that could kind of have imperfection or have errors. And so we, um, you know, we made some of these while we were at school and then we came to Bangkok um, in between our first and second year at grad school and then went to a, a ceramics factory here in Bangkok and made a small production of these. And what was interesting was you know, this idea of flaw or imperfection, it can be ambiguous um, in the sense that there is such thing as good flaws and there's such thing as bad flaws. And so this bowl right here 
has good flaws. You know, the, the, the drips are good. Um, in some cases, the drips would get too long. So the drip would stick up really long. And then that would be a bad flaw because it could kind of break off. Um, so there's, there is this process of, of understanding, you know, when something is not perfect. Um, and I, it's almost like we don't have the, the vocabulary for it, although I suspect the Japanese do. Um, you know, there's this, this ambiguity between what is kind of imperfect with character and just imperfect kind of ugly or bad or not kind of acceptable. Um, and we encounter a lot of that even with natural materials. So we will order a whole bunch of um, wood to make some tables. And of course, wood has grain, it has character and personality and all these kind of positive things. But sometimes it's like, oh, that's bad personality <laughs> or that's bad character. Like that piece of wood is just ugly. Um, and so it, some of it becomes an aesthetic issue, you know, like understanding, um, when something is imperfect and it's acceptable, it, it kind of contributes, it kind of adds character, um, and when something is imperfect and it's bad. And, and that's something, um, I don't have a specific answer for you other than it's kind of an experience thing. Um, and it's something that's actually very hard to communicate to crafts, craftsmen, craftspeople. So, you know, there was a little bit of kind of education process in making these bowls about communicating, um, you know, to these guys on the factory line who they have a specific definition and a specific kind of um, goal that they're trying to achieve. And they want to hit that goal in a very specific, clear way. So when we show them, you know, when we show them the prototypes, the first thing that they wanted to do, that the guys on the factory wanted to do, was make a mold that included all these little drips so that, hey, we can make one for you that's perfect every time, that has the same exact drips, that has the right kind of, you know, uh, spacing of drips, all that stuff. So getting them to understand that, okay, well, if we do that, if we make a mold of the drips, then they lose all their meaning. They lose kind of their power. That imperfection becomes a character and a positive quality. Um, but it's kind of about, you know, defining that framework in which imperfection is acceptable. Does that kind of make sense? Does that help at all? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Okay. I can also... Um, you know, there's there's also um, where is it? It's in alphabetical order. You think I'd be able to? Kevin Mark Low. There's also um, you know Kevin Low's book, um, his first small projects book, which I feel like should be right up here somewhere. Here it is. No, that's anyway. You guys know Kevin Lowe, of course. Um, you know, in his book, the small, the, his first book, the Small Projects book, um, he talks a lot about kind of imperfection, um, error in craftsmanship, um, and I think he talks about it to an extreme end, in that he's he's kind of trying to understand, you know, when can kind of shitty craftsmanship. Um, become acceptable or how can we create a framework for, you know, these things that we cannot con control to exist. And I think that's an interesting conversation as well. Um, and I think if you have his book or have access to his book, the way he talks about it, I think is pretty interesting. And it was actually very, um, very therapeutic for me, you know, coming into this context early on, um, it's irritating me that I can't find the book. Okay. Carrie Hill, Eric Owen Moss. Should be right there. It's not. Um, 
Yeah, it was very therapeutic, I think, in some ways to understand, um, you know, the way that Kevin has has dealt with imperfection and error. Um, you know, for me specifically, communicating it to my guys um, and specifically like the detail that you're talking about, um, you know, that becomes an experience thing, too. So in that specific detail, I decided it was it was better to have, you know, those visible kind of dimples rather than have kind of the form of the paint um, be imperfect. So you would, I think the average person, I think the other, the other way to look at it too is, you know, there's, there's what we might see as, as trained designers or trained architects. Um, and there's what the average person might see as well. And so I think sometimes um, I might understand it, part of the process and understand um, a certain error and be comfortable with it, but, uh, you know, the average person might not. So I think in some ways having error or imperfection um, be a little more obvious or be clearly expressed um, is going to make it more likely to be accepted. And I think that's, I know I'm talking a lot, sorry. I think that's a little bit what Kevin does as well as he kind of, creates a form work or a framework for which that kind of messiness can happen. Um, and so I think, I think that's an important aspect of architectural detailing as well is how do you detail? How do you kind of consider how materials come together and detail in a way in which error can be kind of hidden um, or accommodated. Does that kind of help? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Okay, sure. Let me know if anybody else has questions. Don't be shy. So, uh, hi, Mr. David. Yes. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, okay. The first one is like, um, I see there's um, a lot of prototypes that you shown us during your uh, studio tour just now with interesting mm -hmm. things and also um, different type of material. So, uh, I see that uh, as a very interesting part. Like, I would I'd like to ask, like, what's the intention or the inspiration behind of this uh, different, all these different type of materials and different types of joint things. And then the second question is, um, how do you see craftsmanship in this uh, modern world? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think your first question, you know, I think in some ways um, <clears throat> compared to, I guess, what I'm, what I was used to kind of seeing in the States, um, you know, the material selection that I work with is quite basic. Um, in some ways, it's basically, you know, it's steel, <laughs> um, some basic woods. Um, now we do have access to kind of some nice teak and stuff like that. Um, but really, we're working with fairly basic materials, um, although I do think we're doing kind of non-basic things with those materials. Um, but, you know, with time you know, we, we kind of, I always look for opportunity to expand, you know, my material palette. So it's not so much that I'm, um, I only work with 
steel or stainless steel or, or wood or something like that. Um, but a lot of times I'm choosing um, materials based on, um, you know, my, the vocabulary I'm able to develop. And so, you know, as we, as we continue to work and can kind of continue to kind of solve problems, we are always discovering um, not so much often new materials, but more like new techniques. Um, so like, you know, I was showing you um, those really long pieces of steel, you know, um, three years ago, I had no idea that we would be able to find a, a six, a six meter break, you know, a six meter tool that could bend, that could bend steel. Um, that was, you know, that was not something that was on my radar. And so when we, you know, started thinking about this house project and we started thinking about that column detail, we kind of started looking at standard, you know, um, extruded sections of steel, kind of the standard stuff you can buy off the shelf, more or less. And we're realizing that it it wasn't quite working for our needs. So we just started to kind of ask the question, okay, you know, we knew that we could, we had done three meter bends before, because typically when you buy a sheet of steel, the largest you can buy is three meters had been our experience. Um, and so we were originally thinking that we would, you know, make all the steel from three meter sections. Um, but we started to kind of just do some research, make some phone calls, ask questions. You know, you talk to one factory, you ask them questions that might lead you to another factory. And then eventually we found that, you know, there was a couple of factories actually that had these um, six meter long breaks. And so then that became part of my palette, part of my repertoire of, of tools and ideas. And so, you know, we had um, established, you know, a connection with that factory a couple of years ago. And then about a year after that, um, you know, I had another project where um, we needed to make these really long kind of 5.5 um, meter panels um, that were going to be fabricated here at our studio and then brought in and installed in a hotel lobby. Um, and the hotel was already open and operating. So they needed to be these completely free, free prefabricated units and be very precise. Um, and so I already knew at that point, I knew that I could design, um, you know, a 5.5 meter long piece of steel and have it bent, have it laser cut and bent to the size that I wanted. And so, you know, I was able to kind of, I've been able to kind of add that to my, to my palette. Um, and then just recently we, um, we had for, for another designer, um, we had somebody come and ask if we could make these kind of um, light trays. So these kind of hanging um, suspended light fixtures. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, the guy wanted them um, 11 meters long. So we knew that we wouldn't be able to bend it kind of with those, you know, the, our existing system. Um, and so we were kind of looking in multiple ways to to make these um, things. And we were just planning on welding them together and having these kind of joints and um, doing that. And then at a certain point we were um, researching roofing for another um, project. And so we had this roofing representative come in and she was showing us her roofing. And then at the end, which this is something we always do. We always ask any rep that comes in, like, what else do you sell? What else, you know, what other things do you do? What other, you know, products do you offer? And she was like, oh, we also also offer these um, using our roofing type of tooling. We can also make these metal purlins. Um, and of course, the next question was like, oh, interesting. So do they come six meters or longer? And she was like, I can make them as long as you want, like literally as long as you want, because she's using this kind of roofing technique. So this process and technique that's outside of our normal kind of, um, you know, steel, structural steel kind of vocabulary. And because she's using a, a roll of steel, like literally, you know, a massive car sized toilet paper roll <laughs> like of steel, she can make it as long as that steel, the only limitation is the length of a truck. 
So because we can fairly easily um, access a 12 meter truck, we could make this kind of light tray out of one piece of rolled steel. So, you know, stuff like that, it just, it happens kind of naturally and it's just about being curious, being inquisitive, um, and I don't know, asking the right questions. A lot of, a lot of the, you know, the discoveries or the breakthroughs that we have in the studio, um, you know, discovering new techniques or, or discovering this process has a lot to do with, um, personality and quite literally how personable are you can you pick up the phone and be friendly and and understand who it is you're talking to it's like this kind of collaboration aspect um becomes really critical in terms of just discovering materials and getting shit done getting things done um asking people to use their their tools or their materials in, in different ways has a lot to do with how you ask the question so it's kind of like if you ask the question hey can you you know do this a lot of times their first answer is no but if you ask them to explain to you how the tool works how the technique works what products they offer and what context all that kind of stuff then you can start to really discover things um, in a way um, that you wouldn't be able to discover just through an internet search um, or that kind of thing um, so I think that more than answers your first question. Your second answer, your second question, um, you know, I don't know if there's a good answer for that. I think that it's up to every person to decide individually. Um, you know, I feel very strongly about how we work. I don't feel very strongly about how you should work. <laughs> um, you know, some of my close friends here in Bangkok that are architects, um, you know, they design stuff in a very different way. Their approach is very different. Um, but I respect them. I respect, I think, people that approach their, rig their work with rigor and dedication and thoughtfulness. And whether that's super hands-on and super crafty like, like we are as a studio, or if it, if it tends to be a little more digital and detached and kind of, um, you know, robotic and that sort of thing, then great. Um, but ultimately, in the end, you know, all of us as, as architects, as designers, as makers, you know, what we, our ideas ultimately manifest in material. Um, and so craft is going to be in place no matter what, even in these COVID times where we're doing things digitally and remotely. Um, you know, digital fabrication is not at all a, um, you know, a um, departure from the hand. In fact, a lot of things that we digitally fabricate, that we laser cut, um, that we have CNC made or 3D printed, it still requires a lot of hand work. Um, so I think in the way that, you know, AutoCAD definitely doesn't represent a, a departure from draftsmanship just because, you know, nobody's using pen and, and erasing shields and paper and those kinds of things that actually I grew up using. Um, you know, just because we use these new tools does not mean that there will ever be a, a um, you know, lack of space for craftsmanship. It doesn't mean that somebody needs to be hands-on and, and have dirty fingernails like I do, but um, yeah. Does that answer your question a bit? Yes, thank you. Sure, sure. Anybody else? Actually, you know, so far the, the women have been well represented. I appreciate that. Are there not any any men here that want to ask questions? Yes, here. There we go. Hi, David. Got? Hey, man. Uh, I have one question to ask you about uh, what mistakes have you made along the way when you're designing? 
Because, oh, shit. You know, yeah. Your project seems perfect when you're explaining. I want to know the another side of your project, like the imperfections elements of your project, the mistake have you have been made by you. Yeah. Um, well, make make no mistake. I don't I don't hide the mistakes. That's for sure. I mean, failure is definitely part of the process. Um, there are different types of failure, just like this kind of conversation about flaw. I think you know there's in this making process, it's it's high stakes, you know, like especially when we do things design build or turnkey, you know, there's no other point of responsibility. You know, when you're when you're just the, the designer, the architect, you know, it's easy and you have this kind of architect client contractor, you know, typical relationship, it's kind of easy to point things, you know, to kind of push the blame around. Um, but when you're doing it all yourself, when you're designing it all and you're making it yourself um yeah it's it's tough it's emotionally difficult um and i think you know understanding that failure um will always be there um is a critical come here okay come here say hi real quick and then you gotta go hey this is my daughter since she busted in say hi Hi. Okay. But I'm having a talk here. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that wifey man pick me up. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Oh, yeah. Miss Court told me already. Okay. Bye. Bye. I'm gonna be my room. Okay. Got it. Um. Yeah. You just got to embrace failure. Like my kid's gonna break into the middle of the lecture, so let's be okay about it. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think designing for failure, designing a a certain resiliency to your details to your approach is is important and that's easier to say than do um and that's definitely something that comes with time and experience like you know choosing a way to assemble things um that recognize Tolerance and tolerance is something that I've been dealing with since since my early days of architecture school. Understanding that a a fifty millimeter hole and a fifty millimeter pipe are not going to fit together, they just aren't. Like one is always going to be slightly too small. Um, you know that kind of thing. So how can you you know design something so that things don't have to attach perfectly? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's those kinds of failures, like design failures are one thing, like how do we, um, you know, how do we make sure that we have the right thickness of materials so that this thing isn't wavy? That kind of stuff just comes with, with, with experience. Um, one of the things that we struggle with in the studio is um, lessons that we've already learned. So, you know, those are the kind of failures that I think are not acceptable. Um, you know, for example, when we send something out to get it powder coated, you know, we send, you know, we spend all this time laser cutting something and you send it out to get powder coated this, this kind of paint process, which is how these shelves are, are painted. Um, you know, the process in which we receive it, the way at which it comes back to the studio and is ex inspected and handled with care so that there's no scratches, um, you know, that kind of thing, I think we need to develop a technique and not not um, deviate from that technique because I don't accept scratches in paint. That's an error that is not acceptable, a failure that is not acceptable, that's not okay. But, you know, trying something for the first time, you know, doing this weird little thing and then having it fail that's okay as long as you can accommodate that in your process. Does that kind of help? Yes, it helps. Uh, oh. Oh, I want to ask uh, regarding to your answer just now about uh, how do you seek for solution if you start in a design process or if you start in a try and error process too long? What will you usually do to get out of this process? 
Like if I'm if I'm kind of stuck and I can't find a solution, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I do this thing what, that I've I call effective procrastination. You're familiar <laughs> with the term procrastination, right? With effective, effective procrast. If yeah, I call it effective procrastination. So procrastinating, right, is when you are putting off doing something that you don't really want to do. And so, you know, I think designers, um, creative types have this reputation for being procrastinators, right? Like, um, you know, your accountant buddies, they do their homework and they're ready to go out and, you know, have some beers and whatever. They just get it done and they move on. But when you are engaged in the creative process, you know, it takes time and you can't always rush it. So, you know, I think recognizing that sometimes um, procrastinating or putting off until the last minute, um, you know, your, you know, your design project is not necessarily you being a bad person. It might just be you kind of biding your time until things can really like formalize in your head. So you're not necessarily being lazy like your friends or your mom tells you you are. Um, but what I try to do is make use of that time in between, right? So, um, and I think that's where the benefit of, um, you know, the workshop has been for me. So, you know, part of this way of working is because for me, because I don't like to sit in front of the computer for hours and hours. I need to get up and like, you know, I don't think I have, um, I don't have problems focusing, but, you know, I do like to change it up every once in a while. So for me, if I'm not being able, if I'm not having a breakthrough on this, you know, this floor plan issue, um, you know, this space planning thing, um, or this detailing thing on the computer, then I just get up and do something else. So it's kind of like, I just try to push something else forward. And, and I think that's the benefit, like I was saying earlier, in, you know, kind of tackling details early on is because there's always something to be working on. Um, so for me, you know, if I'm having problems, you know, um, writing the perfect, you know, paragraph in a contract um, or trying to get this, you know, this language, this legal language in a contract down, I might just get up and go sweep the, the shop um, or, or go, you know, like, okay, I know that tool got left out and it's rusty. So I'm going to go sand it down and re-oil it and, you know, go do something kind of manual. And I think for me, just being able to work with my hands is a really way to kind of like free up the mind. So being able to kind of shift, I think, shift in scale, um, you know, shift in physicality, shift in location, shift in space, to me is really important. Just be able to shift your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's, yeah, that would be the advice is to, is to try to engineer a situation for yourself where you can effectively procrastinate. So be able to do something else, be effective on something else while you're giving yourself time, you know, for that, for that breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Now at a certain point, a deadline is a deadline and you got to do it, but <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. so Thanks. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good advice. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. Okay, anybody else? I see you, I see you. You wanna ask a question? It's okay, go for it. You can do it. Hi, David. Hey, there you are. What is your biggest challenge in your career? Career, career, yeah. My biggest what, challenge? Yeah, biggest challenge in your career. Oh, well, that's, that's an easy one to answer, a tough one to discuss. Um, you know, for me, the, my biggest challenge was losing my partner and my, um, yeah, I mean, I lost, I lost my partner, my wife, um, 
died. And she was a critical part of, of who I was as a, as a designer. I mean, we met in architecture school, you know, and I had never quite literally never been a designer without her around. And so she was, you know, part of, part of my process. Um, so to kind of put it in a very simple way. And, um, you know, and without getting too deep into the emotional aspect of it, it, it's, it, um, it was, it's been difficult. It continues to be difficult because I think, um, it's forced me in a way to grow skills that I did not, um, previously foster because ideally a partner, um, you know, whether it's literally your spouse, um, or just a good classmate that you're going to go into business with, ideally those, that person is, um, you know, of course, deeply compatible, like you, you agree on lots of things, but also there's things that you don't agree on and that those things that you don't agree on brings benefit to, to what it is you're working towards. Um, and so M and I were very, very, very similar in many, many ways, but, you know, she definitely had strengths and, um, things that I was, you know, was, am not good at. So, you know, I think um, in some ways, you know, I think realizing, and this is, this is, you know, something, this is, this is midlife crisis kind of shit right here, of course, but, you know, realizing as, as an adult um, that, you know, and as a, as a mid-career professional, that really there is no point of stability. Um, and I think that was, that's kind of like the really interesting thing for me to discover as an adult. And of course, this applies to me as a professional, but to discover as an adult that really there's no point of stability um, is really interesting. As a kid, you look at your parents and you think that they're, they're done. Like they're, they're going to be that way. And like they're adults and the adult is this kind of form of like achievement. It's the plateau. It's everything is normal. You've got all, you've got a job, you've got a car, you do all these things. Um, and like everything is stable. And I think understanding that that's, that's a myth, um, you know, personally is, is I think empowering understanding that, um, you know, life is constantly evolving and changing and there's things you can control and not control. Um, and understanding that professionally, I think, is also um, critical. Uh, uh, it's a good lesson to learn early on. Um, understanding that, um, at least for me, I've, I've come to understand that, like, I, I think I'm just going to continue to operate like a startup for the rest of my professional career. <laughs> um, and, and that, you know... I think the challenge is understanding the challenge in understanding that nothing stays the same um, or rather that there is opportunity in, in the, in being able to continually evolve. So, you know, the, the challenge that the loss of my partner has brought, um, I'm not going to say that it has brought benefits because it certainly hasn't brought benefits but what I've been able to do with that, that loss or that kind of shift um, is question a lot of the things, um, a lot of the things, the priorities that I have as a designer and what's important for me as a professional and what's important for me um, in the studio. Um, and so, you know, I've been practicing now in, in, um, in Thailand for 10 years, but in a way I had to start my practice all over three years ago. Um, so I think understanding that has been a big challenge for me too. So understanding this kind of need to reinvent the studio um, or try to understand what things can stay intact, what things need to change, um, has probably been the biggest challenge for me. Um, yeah, so hopefully there's some aspects of that answer that he can apply to you as well.
Uh-huh. Thank you for the sharing. Sure, sure. Anything else, guys? Okay, finally, my mic is on. Uh, Sorry, I've been uh, missing all this while. I have some technical issues with the uh, sound setting. Anyways, uh, yeah, Any, anyone else on the phone? Ah, I just, I know, before, if, uh, before anyone wants to say anything, um, I think. Um, um, I think that was quite nice that you brought us around on your uh, with that little camera to your office. Yeah, you know, it's like a virtual tour, which is I think it was quite enlightening. I, I didn't expect that. Um, I mean, that's something new with all these uh, kind of online, uh, you know, meeting and conferences or lectures. Yeah, and um, sure. you know, after seeing your office or your practice, I think it has to, it, it definitely has to be up there as you know if uh, if I were to have a practice, I think that would be the ideal kind of setup. <laughs> you know, like you know, I mean, I really enjoyed seeing how many prototypes you have, and you kind of uh, I assume some of it you actually uh, made it yourself in the office. I mean, some you know, kind of uh, of course with. Uh, a third party or a fabricator to kind of help you out. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it must be a great experience for your staff, you know, uh, you know, to be able to work on that level, like, you know, really hands on and at the same time, you know, uh, uh, so you're not just doodling on paper, you're actually dealing with, uh, you know, the actual material in a way. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because um, I remember, I mean, as I recall, when I was a student, um, one of the offices that really impressed me was, uh, uh, well, I, I didn't visit, I mean, uh, it was, uh, what do you think? It was Fuxan. Mm. Uh, they, um, because they had, so the office was um, upstairs, and they, they, had, they, they had a basement. Uh, it was a huge basement, and it was a library of uh, uh, materials library. So they had all their prototypes. So the library is not book. It's like all the prototypes lined up, all mm. the materials, uh, all their models. Of, uh, mm. so that was... You know, it, it 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 reminded me very much what you showed us around. You, know, mm -hmm. like you had this many shelves with um, you know all your models or prototypes lying around. So I think um, you see um, that um, I think that's kind of what we encourage our students to do. Like you know, uh, you know, always make something. You never know what you end up with. You know, uh, yeah. start with a smaller mock-ups and then you improvise, improvise, it kind of, you know, you, you don't know where that leads you or where that takes you. I think that, that surprise of elements, I think it's what, uh, I think the beauty, I think in, in, in yeah. your, your practice, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and the beauty of, uh, you know, uncovering what the material can give you or all these processes, you know, how that would, you know, kind of uh, end up to uh, you know, I think, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way you uh, operate is that, you know, um, there's constantly this element of surprise, you know, sort of at the end of uh, every single project that you do. So I think that's really, uh, I would say, enlightening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm glad that you shared that with you know, my our students, you know, and I hope they you know, sort of opens up their 
you know, a uh, way of thought and uh, and also, you know, you know, way of work as well. You know? mm-hmm. I mean, there's many ways of uh, dealing with it. You know, it's not just everything on a paper or on, you know, on just computers. You know, they, they rely very much on that, like SketchUp, yeah. all that. Yeah, so yeah. I think definitely that, you know, that model making element is so crucial to really understand uh, what you're dealing with. Yeah, and, and 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 I just want to add on also another one. In the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that you you know you feel like you're a constant outsider in Bangkok, um, but I I I I feel I think that 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 is perhaps the the beauty or the advantage you have <laughs> as an outsider you don't take things for granted or you don't that there's no preconception of how things are so you look everything in a kind of very uh, fresh perspective yeah yeah, yeah. If, if for us like we look into let's say like you know if we had to research on our local craft you know um, so our students probably would have like you know oh okay if it's timber carving you know the East Coast is like this, it's like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that I think um, um, how you inject, you know, a kind of your view of things uh, to kind of what has been practiced in in Bangkok or in Thailand in general. Mm-hmm. That what uh, makes it so you know even more beautiful in a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, um, I mean, they're just comments. I don't have questions. I mean, they, the students <laughs> ask, you know, sort of, uh, many questions, really, but yeah. yeah, 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 I agree. I, I think, um, you know, the outsider thing is definitely an advantage. Um, if anything, because you know, when I, um, when I approach, you know, a workshop or a factory to, or you know you know, somebody to ask a question, it's like, you know, they see me coming and they're already like prepared for something weird and off the wall, you know? So just because they see an outsider, you know, they see me as an outsider. And so they're expecting, you know, something from the outside. Um, And like I said, you know, Thai people are, they're, they're cool with that and they're very accommodating and, and kind of open to that kind of um, experience for the most part, everybody's different. Um, and, you know, to your, to your earlier point too, you know, I wanted to kind of emphasize to the students as well, like, you know, this, what I showed you guys and, um, you know, this kind of, what I showed you didn't happen overnight. You know what I mean? Like when I was in architecture school, um, you know, I had no tools. Um, and it was really once I got out of architecture school, in fact, I don't know if we can see it. Like, you know, when I was in architecture school, we were pretty lucky. We, we had a nice um, wood shop. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it from here. But when I got out of school, can I zoom? It won't let me zoom, will it? Oh, huh, I can't zoom. Anyway, you know, when I got out of school, there was, I was like, I couldn't do anything. So I had been in architecture school kind of working on models. And that was really kind of my entry point into making was that I wasn't that good at drawing. So I wasn't really able to express much in drawing. And I would, I felt like I could do more with, with physical models. So I spent more and more time in the model shop with kind of, you know, representational stuff, making physical models. And so that was really how I got increasingly comfortable with tools. And then, like I said, when I got out of school, I, I didn't have access to that model shop anymore. And so I started, you know, buying little tools, you know, um, some of which I still have today. But, you know, the first tool I bought was a little, you know, uh, bench top bandsaw so that I could cut, you know, a little piece of wood. Um, and that bandsaw is still out of my shop <laughs> and I still use it. Um so, you know, I think for any of you guys that, that you know, have, the, have an attraction to doing things, you know, hands-on, you know, 
don't don't think that you have to have a full shop like overnight. Um, it just you can start off with basic tools, start off with basic materials, and as you every time you cut a piece of material, you learn a little bit of something, and so you just continue to kind of build on that on that knowledge base. Um, so, yeah. I think um, quite a number of uh, say, uh, graduates, you know, from uh, you know, uh, kind of various architecture schools in the world, like, mm. you know, where you then start dealing with, you know, uh, a lot. I mean, we we and we studied. There's a lot of um, machinery that we work with, like you know, CNC cutting, laser cutting. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, lately, lately, the three D printing and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, some of them, yes, I think, you know, they are used to, you know, kind of exploring uh, models, ideas, kind of through these uh, model making techniques. But when they come back, uh, especially in Malaysia, uh, or I don't know, in other parts as well, um, you know, we, we don't have access to that uh, uh, kind of, you know, you know, workshop, even workshops, I think yeah. um, it's still, you know, even in our current architecture school, I mean, in our school, we do have a workshop, but it's, it's very, very, it's quite limited, you know, to kind of mm -hmm. what, you know, what is being exposed to in, you know, other architecture schools, uh, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, not sure okay. how... Not sure yeah. how they, they dealt with that, but uh, I'm sure some has resorted to buying, you know, kind of buying. Uh, uh, I mean, some uh, some of the machines are rather affordable, right? I mean, not not CNC machine, of course, not CNC yeah. machine, but, yeah, yeah. But, you know, some others, uh, you know, uh, where they kind of uh, stock it at home or in the office. <laughs> yeah, can help out a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, it kind of goes back to, I'm going to look behind me again as if I'm going to remember where the book is. Um, it re kind of reminds me of that, you know, the the improvising, that, that, that section of the lecture where I kind of show those slides of, you know, people improvising things. One of my favorite books um, has, is just a series of photographs of objects that were made by Russian prisoners. <laughs> and so, you know, some of them are, of course, like, you know, knives to stab people. Like, you know, like when you are in these kind of, um, you know, material and tool deserts, like when you're in present prison, you don't have access to a lot of materials. Um, and yet you so you end up with these extremely creative solutions. Um, and so this book shows these, you know, really creative solutions with basically people making, um, you know, fulfilling their needs making things out of out of trash or out of the few materials or objects that they can get a hold of um and i think if you kind of see that level of creativity of people um you know with extremely limited resources doing extremely creative things then i think you know you can realize that yourself as a creative person with creative or with limited resources are still not without, you know, opportunity for expression. Um, so, yeah. Just some words of encouragement. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Last call for questions. Yeah. Okay. Someone just. Uh, no. Uh, what is it? Your uh, mic is off. My mic is on, but uh, I'm uh, giving okay. giving opportunities to the <laughs> to the not so old people to uh, ask. 
but I do like uh, David's philosophy about you know being relaxed about who you are, and, um, whether you're getting into bigger things or smaller things, and you don't kind of make one decision against the other. And there's no like good and bad in in architecture. Like you could be doing, you know, nothing both one day, and then you can do a donut, and then the next day you're designing a, a massively huge temple, you know, a beautiful temple at that. And um, and so that duality always exists in him. And I I noticed that that's what makes David what he is. I think he's kind of like, he's very relaxed about things, you know, and um, coming and going with the staff and, you know, leveling things in terms of like, who's the boss here, who's not the boss there, that kind of thing. I think with architecture, when you have that kind of spirit, I think it makes you more... Creative, I think. I think that's what I noticed about your work, David. And you, you as a person, mm. I think it starts off with you as a person moving into Thailand, and uh, you know, I wouldn't say bowing down, but you kind of you you you, you humble yourself enough to kind of speak their language and that kind of thing. I think that that mm. same philosophy that you take with uh, materials, that yeah. you actually respect materials in the same way that you uh, deal with people, you know, and that comes with the inner spirit, I think, uh, which makes mm-hmm. you. Uh, the creative person that you are, you give a lot of respect not only to your environment but to the materials you work with. And like you say, you know, even with contractors, that architects in this country. I mean, I, I say this for the record, actually. Architects in this country, right, look down upon suppliers and manufacturers. I think too much, mm-hmm. and I think that doesn't yeah. allow for creativity to evolve. You know, don't you think, David? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think when you when you put yourself up on a pedestal, you're 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 missing the opportunity that you could, you know, learn something. I mean, I do it for, I do it for selfish reasons, <laughs> you know, ultimately like, you know, I, I, well, I'm, I'm a humble person, but ultimately I'm, you know, using that humbleness to try to, to try to do what's best for the project, try to get the most out of, out of the situation that I can. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It's nice to hear. Thank you. And I think I think the saying, you know, that you get you get further with, you know, with what is it? You get further with honey than you do with vinegar. You know, absolutely works with architecture as well. Like if you go to the job site and you see somebody doing a really shitty job, you know, like if you know if you start screaming at them chances are the job's not going to get any better. But if you go in and even if, you know, even if they've ruined something that's really important to you, you know, you should at least start, you know, to, to try to understand why the situation is, is that way. Um, and, you know, try to, try to solve the situation from a, from a more collaborative perspective and showing up and throwing things and dropping F-bombs. So, I was going to say, I mean, it's not getting too philosophical, but I was going to say that you do that with everything, and which is what I, what I saw in your work. Mm. You do that with everything, you know, with the materials that you work with, and, uh, you know, you saw mm. a piece of bamboo that you cannot bend, you don't kind of just throw it out into the bin, right? You kind of try to understand why that happens. So, you know, mm. that, that philosophy, I think, is very obvious in your work philosophy, which I... Mm. It's my it's my takeaway. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been in Bangkok? I'm just curious. Uh, a little over ten years. Um, yeah, oh, that's eleven not, years. Not, not that long. I think, I think the body of work that you've done there. I mean, you know, judging by no. The- no, not not that long. I mean, I guess in the sense, like mm-hmm. I said, I f- still feel like it doesn't feel like ten years. That's for sure. You know, um, feel like there's still a lot to figure out. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Wow. Where where were you practicing before this? Before you came to Bangkok? Um, I was uh, living in uh, San Diego, California, in the states. Yeah. Anyone else? Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, any any last? I mean, not necessarily questions. If you want to say something to David, 
otherwise we might end this soon. Yeah. Hi, David. Yeah. Ah, okay. All yeah, right. Thank good you. question, but that was very insightful uh, lecture. I'm sorry, you're a little quiet. Could you speak and, up just a little? Uh, no question, but that was a very insightful lecture that you gave us just now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's all for me. Okay, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, I have a question uh, to Miss Yusra as well as Mr. Hua Lin as well uh, as Mr. David also. Is to like uh, throughout the years, how how did you guys um retain your passion in your work? Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think for me, it's just it just comes naturally, I guess. I feel like if I wasn't deeply passionate about what I was doing, I would just be doing something else. So, you know, I really do think that um, I guess I'm doing like I'm here. I'm do I, I feel like I was fortunate enough to create a series of circumstances where I'm simply doing exactly what I want to do. So I don't feel like I need to work too hard to keep up the energy. No, of course, everybody has low moments and it's easy to get discouraged and, and that sort of stuff. But I think that um, that's one thing that I've at least been, I think, clear to myself about is that really there's nothing else I'd rather be doing, even if it's, you know, even if it has um, certain side effects, <laughs> you know, even if it has certain side effects, like, um, you know, staying up really, really late on weekends or, um, you know, not making tons of money. So I think that given all the, um, you know, the difficulties or given the negative side effects that, that I still, I'm still doing exactly what I want to do, be doing. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do we, you know, keep doing what we're doing? I think when you, I think when in, when you like what you're doing, then it's not work. So yeah. You keep on, you keep on doing. Okay. So, so that's. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm in teaching now. I, I don't, I don't uh, practice uh, as a consultant. So, I mean, when it comes to example, like you know, giving tutorials, like you know, preparing lectures, preparing programs, creating briefs for the students, you know, it's uh, it's, it's um, I enjoy it. Therefore, you know, when I when I plan it out, it doesn't as I say, it doesn't feel like work. But when it comes to you know, administrative stuff <laughs> for the school, yeah, that. That is work, like hard work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I hate it so much, you know. Uh, but you know, but I mean, there's always, I don't know, there must be a balance. I mean, I mean, you know, it yeah. can't be just joy all the time, right? Uh, yeah. And so, and, and I, I, I look forward, you know, sharing, you know, what I, you know, constantly discover throughout the years. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. You know, I'm forever yeah. learning. Uh, and if you read a recent article, I think on uh, you know uh, Richard Rogers just retired, and he retired at the age of eighty-seven. <laughs> so, so I'm sure, I'm sure you know it's not work. I mean, if you it's not work, you do that yeah. until you're eighty-seven. It, it, it's not work. It, it, it becomes part of your life. Yeah, your way of life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, it seems like there's two approaches to life. Either you are able to kind of, yeah, make money doing what you really like doing, um, or you make money in one way and then spend the rest of your time, you know, doing something else. So it's like you have your work life and then you have other things you do for fun or recreation or like <laughs> compensation for that job that you hate. Um, or job that you don't particularly enjoy. And I think maybe that approach is perfectly valid as well. Um, but yeah, for me, I just happen to kind of combine, try to combine both, you know. 
So who are, you want to say anything about that? Kailin asked you as well. You're just reminding me uh, my retirement is just around the corner. Is that uh, talking about that? Because <laughs> no. you talk about the story. No, I, don't, I, I don't have anything wise to add to what you guys have already said. I think the, the whole passion thing comes out from the inside. I think you can never rely on someone else to entertain you and, t- and give you the meaning of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, that it has to come from the inside. I think the real revelation here is like, you know, David has shared almost his entire life story here. And, and, and that should be enough. Uh, uh, enough evidence to tell you that it has to come from inside. David didn't look out for something else to inspire you. You know, it all comes from inside you. And I think a lot of people say, "Oh, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I get morning and say I'm bored. You know, can someone come up and entertain me?" That's no one's going to do that. You know, you have to do that yourself. You have to say, "What is it I'm going to get up for?" You know. And I think for me, it's always about asking the right question and wearing a big smile and stepping out and saying, "I'm going to make," you know. I'm going to make my day as amazing as it can be. And the way you do that is you, you do it from inside. You, know, you don't rely on me or Yusra or David to cheer you up or to give you the passion. You have to go out there, go to the library, dig up, look into the book, you know, like, you know, uh, go, and, go and read up Palasma to start with that, start with that book, you know, maybe. So I think it's about just tapping out, you know. Um, who was that asking the question? Was it uh, Kailin? Yeah, <laughs> I recognize that voice. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what you do. You just step out and mm-hmm. um, and keep keep the conversations going. I think David also said that in the beginning of his philosophy, he said that it is making and it's creating or whatever it was. It was, uh, but it's also talking. I think conversations with people is extremely important. You must relate to other people, and I think conversations make up a very big deal about, you know, uh, reminding you uh, where you ought to be, where you ought to be going, and why you're okay, you know. Competitions remind you that you are okay, you know. And uh, I think talking is a very important part of an architect's career. And most people, I think, I don't know if David agrees with me, but I think most architects uh, are not talking enough. They're just giving to themselves and all they want to see is get published on a magazine. (laughs) Right. Not enough yeah. conversations, and I I love this kind of workshops and, and dialogues. I think David, I, I really appreciate you taking time off sure, from your sure. daughter, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah. conversations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot of conversations, you know, is very important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for your yeah sharing and also advice. Sure, appreciate sure. it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being inspiring also. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. I think that was a good question to kind of wrap this up. <laughs> sure, sure. From Kylie, yeah. Appreciate that, Kylie. Uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, David, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah my really pleasure. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank yes. you, David. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so okay uh, guys. Oh, All right. Hope we uh, can stop by if you ever in Bangkok. Please tell your daughter, tell your daughter to forgive us all for keeping you for so long. We're so sorry. <laughs> oh, she'll be just fine. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'll speak to you again, David. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And if uh, any of you guys are in Bangkok, feel free to, to we'll stop do that. By. Yeah, we'll so, do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bye guys. Now. Thank you. Bye okay. for now. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Okay, bye. Thank you.